everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Texas Women Photographers Circle. This is our monthly meetup. Here with me this evening are moderators Leslie Sessoms. She's based in the DFW area. And Sue Pitts, she's in Georgetown. Charlie Hickman is in San Antonio. And I'm Linda Nickel, and I'm in Austin. Every month, we invite a guest speaker to share their photography and some of their favorite tips and techniques to help us improve our photography and inspire a little creativity or just nudge us to try something new. The schedule for upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on YouTube. Tonight's guest is Mika Geiger. Mika is a macro photographer who has an affinity for observing nature's tiniest creatures. Mika's curiosity in the natural world nudged her to learn more about her new little friends. And with her eye for detail, she is able to captivate us with her photographs of these tiny and often overlooked critters. In tonight's presentation, Backyard Beauties, Beauties. Mika will discuss the surprisingly varied world of insects that live in your backyard and beyond. And she'll share some techniques and tips to help you highlight their often overlooked beauty. If you're on Instagram, look for her at Mika.Geiger, and you can connect with her through her website, MikaGeiger.com. Mika, it's so nice to have you here. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, We'll do some full disclosure. I, I met Mika through Instagram, I think. I think, yeah, it yeah. Was. just seems like I've known you for years and I don't think that that's a true statement, but um, through Instagram, people, you know, bust out of their Zoom boxes every once in a while. And and I've actually had the um, um, the opportunity to go and shoot with you and and um, have, have a meal with you. So it's fun to kind of like, okay, let's go shoot and let's go eat. So it is. I always like to combine the two whenever I can. <laughs> I, you know, people can persuade me to, to, to meet up with them is where are we going for chips and salsa? Um, so Mika, I skimmed over an introduction for you, but if there's anything you'd like to add, I think, and I wasn't sure if it was an accurate statement, but I think you've completed your Texas Master Naturalist. I have. I have. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that in the presentation. I just completed it in December. And yeah, it was just a natural path for me to go. Um, and it ties in like all of my interests right now. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Well, they kind of go hand in hand. So it's, they do. yeah, I think, you know, the curiosity of, you know, what am I looking at? Is it a good bug? Is it a bad bug? Is it going to bite me or, or what? So um, I think that, that, that education that the Texas master um, naturalist group provides you is just going to kind of pull vault you into something else so it is and that's like tonight you'll see it's sort of a combination of the two because I do talk about the roles that insects play um as well as photographing them so okay, okay. we'll see well, how it goes all right no it's great here yeah it's it's gonna go great <laughs> I, <laughs> <you>. I know <laughs> I'm glad you're so confident. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right. I'm just going to give you the screen and um, you can. Let's see if I can take it. Sure. Should I... Yeah. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I always enjoy sharing my love of insects and photography, and it's especially meaningful to talk about it with a group of Texas photographers, because really Texas is where my insect photography journey started. And um, I've also found that we've got like such a supportive and inspirational community of female photographers here. A little bit about me. Um, I'm based in Austin, Texas, but I'm not a native Texan. I fell in love with Austin when I came here for college. I won't tell you how many years ago, but it was a long time ago. And since then, I've lived in a lot of places, 
15 years in Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, then quite a few years in Pittsburgh, and we finally made our way back to Austin seven years ago, roughly, and we're very happy that we did. Um, I grew up with a mother who adored little creatures, and they loved her. Uh, any animal in need seemed to find its way to her, and she really instilled that love of nature in us. You can see that's a photo of my mom showing a frog to my older sister there. And then my father was a historian of photography, so we always had cameras around, some of them antique. And he was a great teacher. And since childhood, photography has always been an important part of my life. And I had lots of fun doing some freelance uh, photography in Asia. I did mainly travel and editorial photography. And then once I became a mom, I it became, it was always a creative outlet for me. And of course, I took lots of photos of kids and pets and nature whenever I could. And then fast forward to when we're back in Austin during the uh, pandemic isolation when life changed for everyone. And I started spending not just, you know, short walks with my dogs, but hours and hours on the isolated trails with our 200 pound dogs. Uh, the black one is Cinco and the white one is named Casper. And it really being out there in nature just gave me that sense of peace and comfort that I was craving. And then to tie together my love of nature with photography and also to make my hikes a little bit more interesting, I took along that lens that had been collecting dust on the shelf, my macro lens, which I bought, but I tried, I just never really got around to using it. So I started with flowers, tiny little wild, wild flowers I came across, and I was really like fascinated with the minute details that I had never been able to see with my eyes. But then I had, I guess, an aha moment. I spotted a tiny, like quarter to a half an inch, very ordinary looking brown moth. And I don't know what I was expecting to see uh, when I looked at it through my macro lens, but I certainly wasn't expecting to see a princess with braids and a cape looking back at me. And that's when like a whole new world was revealed. And I wanted to see what every insect looked like up close and also learn about their stories. And as I learned about these fascinating creatures and their fragile ecosystem, I just became hooked. And it's really been a life-changing journey for me. I, I never thought at this period of my life, it would be one of such growth and uh, satisfaction, but it really has been. And I think my mom and dad, if they were still around, they'd be very happy to know what I'm doing because I'm doing what's part of both of them. Um, and of course, my curiosity about this world led me to train as a Texas master naturalist, which is a fantastic community who gives back to nature. And it was started by Texas A&M and Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, First, you take classes and go on educational field trips to learn about plants and animal species, as well as geology and uh, archaeology. And then in turn, you get to do lots of cool volunteer opportunities, whether you want to be a field guide at a preserve or if you want to work on pollinating gardens. I've been working on putting one in in an elementary school. That's the kids with little seed bracelets there. Uh, restoring native habitats. There are so many different things that you can do. Uh, that there, it's uh, on the bottom right. Uh, UV lights help scientists uh, document what creatures showed up at night. And they have chapters all over Texas. Uh, there are some links for you. And if you're interested and have any questions, you can reach out to me. I'm always happy to answer them. So here's a broad idea of the topics uh, I'm gonna cover tonight, starting with the amazing diversity we enjoy of insect life here. I'll share tons of photos along with tips 
of how I got the shots as we talk about the different roles that insects play. And of course, I'll cover my equipment, the techniques I use, and go over ways to draw an exciting array of insects to your backyards. Um, insects are not only fascinating to photograph, they're really absolutely critical to life on Earth. And they're the most abundant form of life and, on Earth. And out of all of them, though, only a tiny fraction are what we consider pests. And they're also crucial to pollinating and supporting our food chain in other ways. Um, and Texas is such a great place to photograph insects because we have a really diverse population, one of the most diverse populations in the U.S. And a part of the reason is um, how diverse our landscape is here in Texas, from swamps to deserts and everything in between. Um, moving from big to small, our gardens should also provide a diverse ecosystem. Like no matter how hard we try, you can't completely control our garden environment. And it's all about balance. Um, instead of solely focusing on getting rid of the pests, you want to invite a variety of beneficial insects to your garden. And it's really so fun to discover and learn about insects and it's great to photograph them all. So taking a look at the roles that insects play in nature and your garden's health um, and how they're all interconnected, um, a natural way to break down the roles they play, you can think of them as pollinators, plant eaters, and predators. However, as we'll see later, the boundaries between are not always clear. Uh, one can play more than uh, a single role. And it's kind of human nature to say, oh, it's a good bad bug, it's a bad bug, or it's beneficial, or it's a pest. But the roles are really not black and white either, as we'll see. I'll show you some of my favorite photos of Texas insects in these categories. And as I go, I'll share some uh, photography tips. And please keep in mind that I'm not an entomologist, I'm an insect enthusiast. Uh, I try to get IDs uh, correct, but I make mistakes and I always welcome corrections because for me, it's all about learning. Um, also, I'm horrible with scientific names. Um, let's take a look at the, the pollinators that help ensure that plants can reproduce and stay healthy. And when we think of pollinators, a lot of us at first think of bees and butterflies, and they are indeed wonderful pollinators. So I always love to see more than one insect together in the same place. I think it is visually interesting and it makes a story. It tells a story, whether it's a real story or uh, it's a story for the viewer of the photo. And in this one, I love the sun, the way the sun was uh, shining from behind the butterfly, uh, the backlighting, it really, you can see the, um, the orange uh, sulfur's body through her wings. And so often you only get one shot with insects and then they fly off. But when you can use those components you use with other types of photography to get a nice shot, like the background, the composition, the lighting. And this with this cabbage white butterfly, I was really lucky she gave me time to use those pink blooms as a, a natural frame. And by pressing my lens right against the flowers, they become nearly translucent. I really like using the shooting through when I can. Um, to be honest, like I photograph insects any time of the day I can, even high noon when the light is awful. But early in the morning, it's a fantastic time to photograph insects because insects need the warmth to fly. So early morning, um, they're not as active. And this Gulf fritillary or passion butterfly, it showed up uh, in, well, I discovered it in our grass one morning. And I was able to get so incredibly close to her and photograph her as she peered at me through a blade of grass. Sorry. 
from pollinating butterflies to bees, such as this honeybee. Uh, many times without even taking any photos, especially if there is a lot of activity going on, I just sit and watch. And these bees were flying so quickly among the spiderwort blooms in our yard in like a seemingly random way. But eventually, the more I watched, I noticed an occasional pattern on the stalks. Uh, some of them seemed to start at the bottom of the blooms and eventually make their way up to the top. And again, not every time. But when I saw that pattern, instead of chasing them around the bottom blooms, I waited on the upper blooms when I saw one on the bottom. And eventually I was able to get a few shots. I would focus on uh, the flowers and then the bee would come into focus. It takes, it's a challenge, but it's, I don't know, I enjoy challenges. And usually my photos start with an interesting insect, but sometimes it starts with a flower that I'm attracted to. Uh, I came across this incredibly detailed and colorful uh, false purple thistle, but there weren't any insects on it. So I went on to photograph other things and kept on circling back until I found this gorgeous large American bumblebee uh, enjoying the flower as much as I was. Like honeybees, bumblebees are social, living in, in colonies, but not all bees are social. And our solitary native bees come in many sizes and appearances. Like this itsy bitsy one, I'm not sure what type it is, um, on one of my favorite blooms, the button bush. And there are gorgeous green metallic bees that are fairly small, but because of their vivid colors, they really stand out. I find it so entertaining to watch insects collect pollen and search for nectar. I have a series of photos of this pollen-laden longhorn bee uh, in very interesting positions. And this one looks like it's performing yoga with a downward dog position. So we'll come back later to take a look at some other uh, native bees. Moths are excellent pollinators, and many are nocturnal, making them the night shift pollinators. But hummingbird moths, like the snowberry clearwing moth, they're most active in the day. And they're called hummingbird moths because, like hummingbirds, uh, their wings beat so quickly and they hover above uh, flowers using their long proboscis to reach the nectar. Uh, it was a super challenge getting these shots. I didn't have my telephoto lens that would have been useful. I used my macro lens, so I had to get close. And there were thistles, there were bull thistles everywhere. There was turkey vulture poop. <laughs> but the this moth had been on my bucket list for a long time, and there were quite a few of them around. So it was definitely, definitely worth it. I entitled this photo Pollinator Planet, um, and the button bush uh, flowers really are pollinator magnets or insect magnets. I never pass by a button bush bloom without finding insects on them. And that might look like a, um, a beetle on the top, but it's a, a type of webworm moth. And when its wings are closed, it looks more like a beetle, but when it's in flight, it looks like a wasp. And check out the antennae on this yellow collared scape moth. So fuzzy. The lacewing isn't a moth, but it's a winged insect and it's an excellent pollinator feeding on nectar and pollen. And then we'll take a look at an often overlooked pollinator. Flies. Like bees, adult flies, they visit flowers to feed on the nectar and pollen and they also transport pollen on their bodies as they visit different flowers. The way flies look through the macro lens, that was one of, I don't know, I, that really blew my mind just to see their anatomy when I first started seeing them. And they come in very different forms and including flies that mimic bees like this hoverfly. Uh, looking like bees help them ward off predators, even though hoverflies don't sting at all. And if you're interested in capturing in-flight uh, insects, hoverflies are a good place to start. 
although they're tiny, they really will hover sometimes like right in front of you. You may have seen them when you're walking down the trail, a tiny little fly that just hovers there and then disappears and then it comes back. Uh, they also seem to keep coming back uh, at times to the same flower and that's what happened here. Um, so what I did is I focused on the flower and planted my feet and then waited for the hoverfly to come back. And then I slowly moved my body so that the focus adjusts until the hoverfly was in focus. And it takes a lot of practice, but sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I lose a lot. Uh, Here is one uh, that has tiny individual pollen grains, which I always love to see. And among my absolute favorite bee mimicking flies are bee flies. Uh, this species seems to mimic a fuzzy bumblebee. They're clumsy flyers, so entertaining to watch. They sort of look like toddlers trying out wings for the first time as they sort of tumble around in flight. And when you're in nature looking at insects, try to, I don't know, I like to get it in the zone. I find a lot of times when I'm walking around um, thinking about a lot of things I have to do or didn't do. And that's when I say, okay, take a moment, sit there or stand in one place, shut things down and just open up my senses. What do I smell? What do I see? What do I hear? It's great therapy as well. And Often I hear the high-pitched buzz of these flies well before I see them. And then the photography hunt is on to find them. Beetles. This is another type of insect that passively transports pollens as they visit flowers for nectar and pollen or prey. Um, I took this shot in direct sunlight um, and it would have made for a photo with harsh light and reflections on the ladybug. So I moved my body to block the sun and create a shadow. Now casting your shadow on a lot of insects, it will scare them away, but it didn't with this ladybug. Soft body flower beetle, uh, it eats small insects as well as pollen and nectar. And I always check out that we have so many tiny, tiny wildflowers like this. I think this is a wild drummond's onion to see what hidden treasures I can find. And it's sometimes hard to grasp the scale in macro photography. I mean, even in my mind, I forget just how tiny it is. In macro photo photos, the subjects can become bigger than life. So I find it's nice to provide a size reference that can help your audience. Soldier beetles, um, another great pollinator. They also eat some smaller soft body insects too. The, the species that, you know, all of these, you have different species. So they don't always look the same as this colorful one. And there are so many different types of beetles that pollinate. So let's move on to what might not be most people's favorite pollinators, wasps. Um, but both through my photography and watching them and learning about wasps, I now really have a great appreciation for them. Uh, many like this golden digger wasp are solitary. And as adults, they feed on pollen and nectar. The males don't have stingers and the females aren't aggressive. They don't have a hive or a communal nest to protect. And it's fascinating to watch them move. Um, I use flash to take this photo. It might look like it, it's at night, but it wasn't. It's just if the light from the flash doesn't have something close by to reflect off of, you get that black background. And sometimes I really like it in photos. It can make them more dramatic and other times I prefer not. Um, I came across this common thread wasted wasp, uh, which I had never seen before early one morning uh, this spring. And it was still pretty cool out, so it wasn't ready to fly. And as I approach a new to me insect, I start photographing right away because I never know if it's gonna stick around and I at least wanna get one shot so I can get an identification later. 
So I started taking shots and that background, not very attractive. It was the concrete path. So I wanted to try to get um, a more appealing background. So as I walk slowly, always walk slowly so you don't scare things away. I'm photographing the whole time. And then as I got to the other side, I got the green in the background, which I think is a much prettier photo. We have a great variety of solitary wasps, like this blue wing wasp, who I think is just gorgeous. Um, but we'll talk more about them later when we discuss another role that they play. Uh, we also have social wasps, which have colonies, like this hunter's little paper wasp. I always stay away from social wasps nests. But when the wasps are on their own foraging, they're focused on their task and they don't seem to notice me even when I'm close. And I love watching them at work. Um, a photo of an insect just sitting on something, I don't know, it's a lot more interesting if you get them in action. I had no idea that there are wasps that make honey, but this is a Mexican honey wasp, one of the few wasps that does. So now that we've taken a look at some of the many pollinators we have here in Texas, let's take a look at some of the plant eating insects that you might come across like these aphids. And as we go through the plant eating insects, do keep in mind that whether or not they're a pest, it's a matter of circumstance. Like some are just passing through your garden, nibbling as they go. They don't invite all their friends, so they might not be a pest. And so it really matters where they are, what they're doing. Not all plant eating insects create the impact that makes us think of them as pests. For example, homeowners, urban gardeners don't normally have to worry about grasshoppers, but farmlands, fields, they do. Um, this one's called a differential grasshopper, and I was so pleased to come across it with that sun lighting it from behind, the backlighting. It brings out the lines of the leaves and really highlights this hopper. I was um, always thrilled to come across Aztec grasshopper nymphs. They're tiny, tiny when they start out. They're one of the most colorful grasshoppers I've come across. Um, and they would be impossible to see if not for their coloring. The coloring helps though uh, tell predators that they might be dangerous, even though they're not. They lose all that uh, striking coloring though by the time they reach adulthood. And how cool is this? A grasshopper taking off its pants. Grasshoppers uh, molt, shedding their exoskeleton about five times. I checked on its progress uh, when I was coming back on the trail and found its entire exoskeleton. I, I just find learning about life cycles so interesting. And I always look for photos that tell a story like this one with the grasshopper that's uh, just barely hanging on. Uh, we also have other plant eaters like this female bush, uh, Katie did, which I mistakenly thought was, oh, that's obviously a male, but it isn't, it's a female and that appendant is a ovipositor that she uses for laying eggs. And here is a little katydid nymph, which always, they remind me of uh, court jesters in uniform. This striking photogenic uh, cucumber beetle was, uh, they're considered a potentially damaging pest uh, for many vegetable crops, especially, and obviously those in the cucumber family. Uh, some species are striped, some are spotted. Uh, I don't have a vegetable garden and I've seen one in my, I've seen them in my garden before, but they've either never stuck around or they've been eaten by predators and I've never had a problem with them. Uh, here are some milkweed beetles. You'll see them sharing the milkweed with monarch caterpillars and the milkweed actually, it does offer the beetles the same protection it offers the caterpillars, it makes them unpleasant or toxic to eat. And uh, this one I use flash for because I wanted to get them both in focus and the flash gave me uh, the ability to do that because I was able to use uh, 
a greater aperture. Uh, this leaf-footed bug uses its long proboscis to suck the nutrients out of plants. The level of damage they cause in the home garden is usually fairly low, I believe, and you can see why it's called a leaf-footed bug. Um, and this is a good example of how the right angle can really showcase the unique features of your subject. And leaf hoppers like this real um, striking looking, it's called a candy striped hopper. I've only seen one once, I'd love to see it again. And of course, caterpillars, many of which, uh, like this black swallowtail caterpillar, stick to their host plants on which you know they are hatched from eggs. And the black swallowtail caterpillar, like spinel, dill, carrot tops. Um, I like showing the habitat sometimes. So I captured this one from a little further away. And I used a shallower depth of field to get that softness that I saw in the scene. And one day I noticed my dogs uh, sniffing this very fuzzy caterpillar in our garden. So I carefully put it in a container and brought it inside to relocate somewhere else the next day. Uh, when it was inside, I photographed it. It's one of the few times I photograph things outside of where I find them. And once it relaxed, it started moving around. It was just amazing to see its face through the macro lens. It looked like something out of a bar scene in Star Wars. And only after I relocated it to a woody area did I research it. And it's a good thing I handled it gently because I discovered this is an asp caterpillar, we call them. It's the caterpillar of the southern flannel moth. And they have a these poisonous barbs under all that fur and their stings are known to be severe. So note to self, research before handling. Oops, wrong way. Well, you can actually kind of see the barbs sticking out right there. I was photographing this hairless bee fly. They're not plant eaters. Um, but when I was photographing it, I noticed these uh, photo bombers. These are thirps and do eat plants. You might be able to see them better uh, zoomed in here. I love photo bombers. It's, it's so fun to look at your photos later and see what your eyes missed. Uh, this shiny flea beetle is another plant eater. And I often I'll stick with my subjects as long as they don't seem to mind me around. I like to observe them and also get them from different sides. I can really, really help you with identifications later, and it can also offer some surprises. By the way, I use flash with this, and this is a good example of there's no black background. There are leaves behind uh, this insect, so uh, they were able to, the flash was able to bring out that color as well. And the final third of the triangular relationship are the predators and some parasitoids uh, who help keep the plant eaters in check. So we want them around our gardens as well. Dragonflies and damselflies are predators and they're really skilled hunters built to catch prey in flight. Uh, this damselfly. I think it's munching on a moth. This is a female eastern amber wing uh, dragonfly. It's one of the smaller dragonflies uh, species that we have. It's only about an inch long and it mimics a wasp both in its coloration and it even twitches its abdomen to warn off predators. And she was a frequent uh, visitor to our garden. And I was able to tell it was the same one because she was missing one leg. I named her Zara. And over time, she got used to me and would often land fairly close. And it was really like such a treasured treat to be able to photograph her so often and get different expressions and really study her. And this is what I think is one of the advantages of taking photos in your garden or somewhere that you frequent all the time, changes in the environment are immediately noticeable and repeat visitors become familiar. Here's another one of her looking up. 
I mentioned earlier how it's useful to study insect behavior and dragonflies like this extremely bright colored neon skimmer. I really didn't amp up the saturation in this. If you see them in nature, it just, they look unnatural. They're, they're so brightly colored. Uh, they're Dragonflies are territorial and tend to return to the same perch. And this allowed me to move around its perch and wait for it to hopefully return. I wanted to see what it would look like if I had the green tree line as the background. And voila, we have Gandalf with his wizard staff. And dragonflies are great to photograph because they're fairly large and they do have that behavior where they tend to come back to the same perch. Uh, backlighting worked well here to highlight the grass in this photo. I call this uh, one champion of the ladybug rodeo. And ladybugs are pollinators, but they also, as we know, eat, love to eat aphids and other small bodied insects and eggs. And even though it's easy to recognize ladybugs as adults, you may want to become familiar with their younger selves. Uh, the larva on the right of the ladybug eats tons of aphids, and it's great to have them around uh, catching a shot in movement, even one leg up. I think it makes it more interesting than just photographing an insect that's stationary. Uh, that's a ladybug pupa on the left. And while we're talking about surprisingly different looking larva, I spotted this when I was photographing some beetles and I noticed it. I thought it was like insect poop or something. And then it started to move. So of course I started photographing it and all of a sudden its head and pincers came out. And I noticed it had all of this debris, a lichen and a dead insect uh, pieces it was carrying on its back. Here's a zoomed in view that might be able to give you a better view of the pincers. So it was time to research. And can you guess what this is the larva of? The green lacewing, the wonderful pollinator I mentioned before. Uh, the larva are avid aphid eaters. <laughs> I definitely can't say that 10 times fast. In fact, they're known as aphid lions, and it's believed that some species carry junk on their back. Some of them don't as a disguise uh, when they're hunting aphids, and perhaps they do this because um, some ants, such as carpenter ants, some carpenter ant species have a special relationship with aphids. Uh, the ants like to eat the honeydew, the secretion, sweet secretion that uh, aphids uh, extract, not extract, but exude. And in return for the honeydew, the ants protect, protect the aphids. So maybe uh, they use that clever disguise so they can get closer to the aphids without the ants noticing them. Okay, this photo, not a very pretty photo. I took this because I was having an awful aphid infestation on my milkweed plants. I saw those strange looking slug-like creatures, which I thought were joining the aphids in a milkweed feast. And then I thought, where are my predators when I need them? And then through research, I discovered that these kind of ugly creatures were actually eating the aphids, not the milkweed. They're the larva of our old friend, the pollinating hoverfly, which just blew my mind. <laughs> and this is another photo, by the way, that started with the, uh, the flower I kept on seeing. I don't know what they're called. They're tiny little flowers. And I just fell in love with them, but I never saw any insects on them. And just every time I took my dogs to the park that's really nearby, I checked out the flowers to see if I could spot anything. And I finally found a hopper fly on them. So now let's go back a little bit to the pollinating solitary wasps. As I mentioned, the adults feed on pollen and nectar. The females work really hard to provide for their babies. 
you know, each female works alone, digs a, a tunnel in the ground, and there she'll make chambers where each individual egg is laid. Uh, the mother catches and paralyzes an insect and places it in a chamber and lays the egg on it or near it. She seals each chamber, and that way each larva has enough food to eat through development. The type of insect caught depends on the species. I've shown you here the blue-winged uh, wasp likes June bug and Japanese beetle larva. Golden digger tends to like crickets for its babies. Uh, that common thread-waisted wasp caterpillars, some other ones. And then we have the aptly named uh, stink bug hunter wasp and you can guess what that one hunts. And bee flies, they're not just pollinators. That's what I mean. All the lines get crossed in nature. And like many solitary wasps, its, larva, um, its larvae are predators. Adult female bee flies, uh, they flick their eggs into nests, like into ground nests, like solitary bees nests, where their larva, when they hatch, they'll eat uh, the pollen that was stored for the bees and also the bee larvae itself. And I know like you might think the methods of these insects are cruel, but they really aren't mean. They're just, nature comes up with some ingenious ways to survive. Spiders are fabulous predators to have in your garden because they're very good at their job. And I know they're not everyone's favorites, but I think jumping spiders with those big eyes are so darn cute. And they're ambush spiders. They don't use webs. They wait and then they'll pounce on prey when it comes close enough. Crab spiders are another type of ambush spider. I photographed this one while it was uh, keeping its eye on a bee fly that it never got. Um, some species of the crab spiders, they change their colors to sort of match the flower they're waiting on. And then we have another type of ambush spider, the lynx spiders. Some of these are nice and bright green as well. And I took a number of photos of this uh, web weaving garden spider uh, with trees as the background, but then I got low. And with the sky in the background, it kind of looked like the spider was weaving a cloud. Praying mantis are great hunters. Uh, this one is a tiny baby I came across. And again, scale reference I think was useful. Uh, I now keep rulers in my backpack. Um, robber flies are incredible at catching insects mid-flight. And I got some really nice bouquet because I was fairly close to the robber fly and the robber fly was far from the background with the light coming in through the trees. And there are many types of assassin bugs, also very good predators. This one uh, is actually assassin bug nymph and uh, they use their proboscis to hunt, and I know it might look cruel, but, you know, they can't go to uh, the butcher department in a grocery store. They have to do it themselves. Wheel bugs are one of my absolute favorite ambush bugs because they're just so crazy looking. Don't handle them because while they're really quite shy and docile, uh, if they stick you with that proboscis in defense, it can be quite painful, I've heard. A few months ago, my husband came in and said, honey, come here. You're going to love me when you see this. And I know whenever he says something like that, it's usually a bug. And sure enough, much to my delight, there was this female wheel bug who was laying her eggs on a planter in our yard. So she died. They died right after laying their eggs. But I kept an eye on the eggs. And in March... We had 15 wheel assassin bug nymphs in our garden. And once again, it was such an advantage to have this happen in our garden because I was able to keep checking on it. I was able to observe and photograph the nymphs in action for a little over a month. And if I had come across the eggs on a trail I was visiting one time, it would have been a shot instead of a whole experience. 
Okay, now we're back to the uh, equipment. Um, and uh, I'll share with you my equipment and then go over some techniques. So I use the Sony 7R3 as my camera. It's a mirrorless full frame camera. It has enough megapixels so I can have some leeway in cropping, which is really nice. Uh, the lens I use is a 90 millimeter Sony lens. Uh, it's it's uh, very sharp, has image stabilization, sorry, stabilization, which is nice. And I don't always use it to its greatest magnification. That's one of the things with a dedicated macro lens, you can focus to infinity or up close. Uh, so it's even great for portraits. And I do a lot of close up as well as macro. I really don't differentiate. I use whatever I think will work best with the subject and how I want to show the subject. And sometimes on top of my uh, macro lens, I'll screw the Nisi. I have the 77 millimeter close-up lens. It's you know sort of like a filter, and it will give me even a greater amount of detail. Um, I love the look of natural light, and I use natural light as the sole source of light whenever I can, especially with my close-up work, you know, versus the macro. And natural light, uh, it usually means I'm using high ISOs often. And when I shoot without flash with high ISO, I'll use Topaz Denoise in editing, which is really amazing at getting rid of that noise. Uh, there are limitations, though, with uh, natural light, because with macro photography, you're so close to your subject and you naturally have a very limited depth of field. So you want to use narrow apertures and you often need fast shutter speeds to freeze the movements of the insects. So flash is really a game changer in these situations with macro photography. And if you're using um, flash in macro photography, a diffuser is essential because you want to place light directly in front of the lens. Like with this, this little figurine I have, it shows you basically what my focusing distance is when um, at the closest focal point. So you want the light right in front of it and you want a nice even lighting with, with no uh, hot spots. I use the AK diffuser these days, which is made by a uh, macro photographer in Florida. It's solidly made. It gives off an amazing amount of diffused light. And it also comes with an LED light, which you can attach to use if you're photographing at night or low light. Um, you can also make your own flash diffusers. I've made quite a few. It's fun. And you'll find lots of creative designs if you Google it. Alternatives to a dedicated macro lens. I really like, if you're interested in seeing this hidden world, I encourage you to do it whatever way you can. You can get extension tubes uh, to attach to your lenses. If you do, make sure to get one with uh, electronic contacts so your camera can still communicate with your lens. You could also use, you know, the a macro filter like the Nisi I mentioned earlier or the Raynox, and you can use that on a prime lens or a telephoto lens to create a macro effect. I think even if you're using it on a 200 millimeter with the Nisi, it gives you nearly uh, close to a one-to-one -one reproduction. And there is also there are also macro lenses that you can attach to uh, your smartphone with either a clip. Some of them have uh, cases, you screw it on. And uh, I've used Apexel in the past. Now I'm trying out the moment lens. And they take surprisingly good photos with just a decent smartphone camera. These are both ones that I took uh, with my phone. And you know, the good thing about the phone, you always have it with you. So even when I don't have my camera gear with me, I have my phone, and I have that macro attachment. And I talk a lot about macro lenses for insect photography, but I do use telephoto lenses too, at times for larger subjects, 
uh, such as this, or in further away, the striped hummingbird moth. It was above me in a Mexican plum uh, tree, as was this pipe vine swallowtail. And you get still really good detail. It also comes in handy with dragonflies, which are larger, and they seem to be a lot of times over water where it's kind of inaccessible. You can't like march out there with your macro lens. And it's great for in-flight flying insects like dragonflies or butterflies. So as I've developed my macro skills, I've learned some key techniques that I rely on to make the most of my equipment and the subjects. I'm still learning as I go. Uh, I often use manual focus, but in many circumstances, especially if there's a fast moving subject with a clean background, my camera's autofocus is so much better at focusing than I can. And when I'm using um, the autofocus, I do use the flexible or variable spot. So that way you can touch the screen or move the wheel uh, to put that little square and tell the camera where you want it to focus so the camera's not deciding where to focus. And then when I focus manually, um, there are two uh, features that I use a lot, which help me a lot with nailing the focus. I use peaking assist, which I think if you have mirrorless or live view, uh, DSLR, you probably have that feature. And it displays a color uh, to signify exactly what portion of the photo is in focus. So that way, if you want the insect eye to be in focus, the color will change. These are two photos I took to uh, hopefully show you. I had the peaking assist, the color set to red, and these are some flowers that I just shot as an example. So on one photo, you can see the focus was at the nearby photos, uh, flowers on the left, and then in the second uh, photo, I focus further away, and that way you've got a good idea of exactly where your focus is. And then when I've got that color up there, I'll uh, press the focus magnification so I can really zoom in and then I fine tune uh, the focus. Um, and to help me switch between the different shooting uh, scenarios, I program my memory buttons on my camera with settings for the different scenarios. So I have one program programmable memory button like number one. I have uh, it with my basic settings for stationary or slow moving insects. And then if all of a sudden I'm photographing a fast moving subject, I switch to two where I have all of my settings like the shutter speed, the aperture I usually use uh, on number two, and then flash, I have my settings on the other programmable button. So these, I'll give you just my initial settings, um, but they really are just my starting point. I'm always seeing what the photo looks like and making adjustments. I usually have my aperture set between 7.1 and 11. A lot of times I start shooting from further away so I can get away with a wider aperture. Auto ISO, I always use uh, unless I'm using flash and I'll sometimes put a max on that but I still I would rather have a lot of grain and get the photo than not get the photo at all. Shutter speed setting it depends on the situation uh, 1 2 50th I don't have the steadiest hand so that's like my minimum. Fast moving subjects 1 500 to a thousand like bees things like that. Flying insects I start at 1 over 1600 drive mode high, high plus, so I can press down and get as many shots as I can quickly. And I keep my silent shooting off because when it's on, silent shooting can, I don't know why, but it can like make a sort of like ghosting of the wings. So I keep my silent shooting off. And if I'm using flash, these are my settings. Uh, I have a, my shutter speed at 1 200th, which is the sync speed for the Sony. Sometimes I'll change that too. Uh, with the flash, that's when I'm going for a greater depth of field. So I'll do it around F11, F13, but sometimes really 
uh, go further than that. ISO around 100 or 200. And I have my flash set to manual. And I started at like 1 16th power or 1 8th. Um, and then I'll go from there. Daylight, I uh, the auto, the color setting uh, daylight, I think is a more natural uh, color to my eyes. And I auto review the images. I have the camera set to auto review at first when I'm in a new situation so I can make adjustments right away. Okay, so now sort of putting it all together, um, the right equipment's only part of the recipe and you can help attract a wide variety of beautiful subjects by creating an insect welcoming garden. And this is great for diversity of our ecosystem, but it will also attract um, some really interesting insects to photograph. So ways to uh, do this, you can have a variety of native plants with different uh, shaped flowers and heights. Uh, different insects have different preferences and also you know, physical ability to reach the nectar uh, changes depending on the type of insect. Have some source of water, like of course a fountain or a pond would be fantastic, but even a small dish, like I have a plant uh, pot saucer filled with shallow water and you can put some sand or stones in there. Keep the water shallow though for them. And it will be greatly appreciated by thirsty insects like this tiny potter wasp, butterflies, and moths. Also be a messy gardener. Um, leave some leaf litter, bare ground, and sticks or logs. This helps beetles as well as insects uh, other insects like the snowberry clearwing moth, uh, their, their pupae, uh, it, they slowly mature in cocoons covered in the leaf litter. And yeah, beetles love hiding in the leaves. It also, the bare ground also helps uh, some of our native bees. 70% of our native bees make their nests in the ground like this mining bee. And remember, they're solitary bees. So we're not talking about a hive or a colony. It's really individuals that lay their eggs in a hole. Um, also use consider using compost as an alternative to mulch. It gives them easier access to the ground. Also, don't cut back stalks or leaves too early. Insects lay their eggs on leaves. And 30% of our native bees, they use cavities for nurseries. Uh, so they'll find uh, like holes that were in trees or rotting wood made by other insects, or they'll use hollow stems from plants. Uh, this is a leaf cutter bug that's a, a cavity bee. And you can tell the leaf uh, cutter bees because they have that the pollen they collected on their butt. Um, so cut back uh, hollow and pithy stems at a variety of heights. Uh, after the flowers are gone around six to 18 inches. And uh, eventually when you do cut them down, what you can do is bundle them up um, and keep them upright uh, against like a fence or a shed. And that way, if there are any left in there, they have a way to get out. Uh, here is a mason bee, that's a cavity bee. It's emerging from a bee nursery that I have in my garden. So no discussion, I think, about photography. Uh, photographing wildlife, including insects, would be complete without touching on how our behavior as photographer impacts them. Um, and this is sort of my individual view. I think of myself as an observer, a documenter. It's their world. So I really try not to interfere. And I tend to think of them as individuals. It's Zara the dragonfly rather than it's just another dragonfly. And some like this crane fly have very little time to, to live. And in that time, they have to find a mate and lay eggs. And I really don't want to in, interfere with that. So I try not to disturb them. I try not to move them. And finding food is a really big deal for them. 
It's a matter of survival, and I don't want to get in their way. Uh, this crab spider picked the spiderwort flower in our garden to lay in wait for prey all day. And even at night when the flower curled up, it remained. Finally, after a couple of days, it was rewarded for its patience. Um, if I had moved it or scared it away, it would have to start all over again. And I try to resist handling insects. I mean, sometimes I do, but this philosophy was really reinforced when I was photographing this adorable bull jumping spider that was on a spent upright uh, prairie cone flower. And the yellow background that was from, I think flowers that were in the background, it looked really nice, but I saw that bright blue sky and I thought, ooh, that might be a nicer background. So I gently tore off the stalk and held up the flower with the jumping spider on it. I got out like two shots, not very good ones. And this dragonfly came swooping down and carried the spider off. And the dragonfly was just doing what it was supposed to do, but I kind of felt like I hadn't been. Um, I get asked a lot about uh, identifying insects and uh, I'll, I think I'm running a little bit over, so I won't go into too much detail, but the apps that I use, I can, Linda can give these as references. It's the Seek app I use in the field for like sort of a fast, like what's that insect? iNaturalist app, it's an amazing resource for identifying plants, animals. Also I recently found out it identifies scat and, um, and animal tracks. And it also helps scientists keep track of what is being found and where. So when you enter something into iNaturalist, it's being put to use. And you can always use it, also use it backwards to see what's being found in a particular area you'll be visiting. And I've got a lot of good resources for books and websites that you can take a look at. Um, you can contact me and I can get these to you. And here are additional resources, some for host plants, uh, for butterflies, it's a great one. And then if you're interested in finding out more about identifying garden pests, this is for Texas uh, vegetable gardens, it's great. And that's it, thank you for sticking with me. Uh, if you wanna get in touch with me, if you have any questions or uh, anything, always reach out, I'm happy to help. Yay. Okay. <laughs> You're not done yet. I got a few questions. Okay. Let um, me stop my share. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're, okay. a, pro. You're a pro at this. I usually have to tell people. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I, I was trying to be good and putting them in some order and it, it got out of order. So um, I'll just go down my list. Um, Rose is curious. Do dragonflies tend to go back to certain plants? like a particular type of plant, not that I've noticed. I mean, I get them even in my yard and we don't really have a water source and they tend to like high ones because they like to have that perch so that they can see everything. So like in my yard, I get them on the yucca um, and by water, they tend to be on higher ones. I haven't noticed, that's a good question. I haven't noticed any particular type of plant that they like. It might be more of location and height. Okay. Um, you, I might have missed it, but Yvonne's question was, what lens do you use for the dragonflies? So you're using the zoom, right? No, I like frequently, I tend to, macro is what I always have with me. So I tend to use my macro lens with the dragonflies. There are some like that one that I had in the section with like the ones in flight and the four spotted pendant, that blue one. Um, that was with telephoto lens. So it's a mixture that I use. Telephotos though, it's a, it, they work quite well for dragonflies, but sometimes I like to get, you know, a lot of detail too. Okay. Um, Jill's question is um, on your flash, you're, you're using a um, flash you've added, not, I mean, not your camera. Correct. It's a speed light. It's a speed light. I should have put what type it is. It's a, a flashpoint speed light, um, which is, I think flashpoint is the same as Godox. Speed okay. light. 
And then Valerie wants to know, how often do you use your flash for your insects? I'm starting to more and more. I, I was like, I just went into it kicking and screaming. I didn't want to use flash. I like, I love the freedom of not having flash and I like the relationship. I don't know. It, it feels much freer not to use it, but I now am using it more for sure. I don't know percentage wise. I don't know, but I am definitely using it more in my photos and I'm getting better at it. I still, yeah. Okay. Um, Sue has a question and I'm not sure the context, but it was when you were talking about magnifying your focus, she wants to know, can you take the photo when you have the magnified focus? You know, I don't know. I. Are you just using it to look at it to make sure you've. Yeah. And I'm trying to think if I go out and then press the shutter or not. And it's one of those things that's so automatic for me now. Yeah. I'm not sure if I exit or not. So I'm not sure, Sue. I can, I'll try it out and let you know. <gasps> okay. I think it's hard if you're zoomed in because then you don't see the frame. So I think I zoom out again and I have it programmed to one of my buttons on the back. So it makes it very easy to magnify and then go back out. Okay. Um, Rose's question. Um, she's curious, have you ever come across an insect that you took pictures of and then realized it was not, hasn't been identified before. Have you? No, I haven't. I would love that to happen, Rose, but I haven't. <laughs> there are so many insects out there, though. But there are a lot of insects that we don't know about. You know, they they say like there are so many more that haven't been identified. So maybe one day we'll see. <laughs> um, all right, last question. Um, Kathy is curious, do you wear neutral color clothes so you don't attract insects to your body? And are you careful of the smells that you might be wearing, such as soaps or perfumes? Yeah, I am actually. I mean, I don't always, because like sometimes I always have my camera with me. So time, like I'm walking the dogs, I'm going out, I'm not necessarily in uh, neutral colors. But yes, when I'm on a macro photography outing, neutral colors insect spray too. I'm sure not to uh, like have too much on around my ankles sometimes. Um, and yeah, I, I don't put on perfume or moisturizer or anything like that. Okay. Mika, you did great. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Thank you for, um, um, I mean, in doing this, I know this is not, would not have been your first choice to volunteer. So that's why you have to go after people, like just yeah. come do it. It's, it's not fun. in my comfort zone, but it's sometimes good to stretch that. So, you know, yeah. thank you so much for having me and it's a Great. wonderful opportunity and I really enjoyed it. Well, it's, you know, you've opened my world to different subjects. I mean, I was in my front yard all the way down, almost my face in the dirt trying to get this little swallowtail caterpillar this afternoon. And I, my neighbor's walking a dog and he's like, I'm just not even going to ask. So I know I get people who stop frequently and say, oh, are you okay? You know, yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. You're just I do wear, by the way, um, like clothing wise and stuff. I find knee pads really come in handy. I have these ones that are super easy to put on and take off and they will save me sometimes. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Mika, I'll, I'm going to say thank you one more time. Thank you. And, um, I so, so appreciate it. You ladies, you can connect with Mika through her website, Mika geiger.com and on instagram you can find her at mika.geiger and i will um, include those links in the show notes when it goes to the youtube thank you please do because there are some really good books in there and references so please do yeah. all right our next meeting is on thursday june 1st and I've got Colorado-based travel and landscape photographer Shanda Aiken is going to be here for us. And she's going to share some tips in her presentation called Self 
publishing a photography book. That's a project she just finished. So I hope that you guys will join us for that. And until next time, I hope that you get a chance to go out and do some exploring with your cameras and we will see you in June.